Om Shanti. I would like to share some of my experiences, my story of my own spiritual journey and perhaps especially how the Maha Mantra of Follow the Father has really given me a lot of courage and enthusiasm to keep moving forward. I actually grew up in Melbourne. I had a very good life and I think through my teenage years I was always searching for something. I got involved in a lot of social movements for change but there was something deep inside of me that was always feeling or aiming for something higher. I was searching but I really didn't know what I was searching for. I went to university and I studied architecture, but this feeling inside to find my truth was very, very strong. So I took time out from my studies when I was just 20 years old and I traveled the world. And many times I see that as my education because without any conscious decision, I began to live in so many different religious communities. I live with Sikhs, and as you know, Sikhs take in travellers. I lived with Buddhists in a Buddhist monastery. I lived with Muslims during Ramadan. I lived in a Chinese temple, a Taoist temple. I went right through Southeast Asia, and then I came to India. I went to the Ganges. I went to where the Dalai Lama lives and spent time in Dharamsala. I live with a yogi in the Himalayas, and then I went right through the Middle East, through Pakistan, Afghanistan. And I settled in Europe, and I lived in a Christian monastery in Belgium. And it was a wonderful experience for me, but as I went, I began to feel, well, everyone says wonderful things, but what I was interested in was really, how do you experience, how do you convert what you know into an experience or a feeling inside. I was living and working in London and while I was there I went round to all the different spiritual organisations, even the psychological organisations too. There was the cutting edge, the latest in psychology. And I used to go to a place called the Spiritualist Association of Great Britain. And Daddy Jenki, who was the former head of the Brahma Kumaris, and Sister Genti, used to go there and give talks. And I went to one of their talks, and as soon as I saw them, I could see that they weren't just speaking a theory, but that it was coming from a deep place of experience. And this really began to attract me. So I went along to the meditation centre, the Brahma Kumari Centre in London. And I did a meditation course and really it made so much sense to me. Um, all the ideas made a lot of sense to me. But I was really trying to understand God as the supreme soul, that point, that Jyoti Bindu, point of light. And one day I was walking down the road after I'd been to the centre and I was thinking so deeply about God and this relationship with God. And I felt absolutely drenched in love. It was like time stopped. There was a pause button on time and I had this eternal feeling of this purity of love, this purity of belonging, this sense of connection. And my whole inner world said, I've come home. This is where I belong. And I began to realize that I was sort of looking for someone or something, but it was more reawakening and experience in myself of this relationship with God, this relationship of love. And then I actually went to around London and I spent some time in London. And then Daddy Jenki invited me to go to the headquarters in Mount Abu. 
And my first meeting with Avi Akbab Dada is still such a clear experience inside of me. I was only practicing for a few months. And Baba spoke Amoli as he does. And then I was invited to sit in front of Baba. And Baba gave me long, long drishti. He looked so deep into the soul. I almost felt Baba scanned the memory track of the soul. And his vision fell on a part of me that had sort of gone asleep. That's the only way I could describe it. The original me, the pure me, the elevated me, the deity form of me. Baba's vision fell on that. And it's almost like Baba's vision, his drishti, massaged that to the surface and introduced me to who I really was. I had such a sense of my own self-value, if I can say, and something changed in me that night. I felt really different. And it just felt just the vision of the Father. His vision didn't see the old me. I realized that my vision was on a part of me that was, you know, the weaker part of me or the negative part of me. But Baba saw the original part of me, the positive part, the pure part. And just his vision began to shift things for me. And during that first visit, I met Baba so many times. And one evening I was in the courtyard of Pandav Bhavan in Mount Abu. And one of the sisters came up to me and said, come with me, someone wants to meet you. She didn't say who. And I went with her into Baba's room, which is where Brahma Baba used to live when he was in the physical world. And when I went in there, Baba was there. Baba had come for a meeting with all the daddies, the senior sisters. They'd finished their meeting and they invited me in to meet Baba. And it was just so wonderful. Baba was really just like a father. <clears throat> he welcomed me. He showed me so much love and so much care. And I really think Baba's example of that constant love, that constant goodwill, that constant attitude of seeing my value has really been the way that I've been able to keep moving forward on this path. And whenever things come to challenge me, I just put myself under that feeling of love and it just always gives me the enthusiasm and courage to move forward. And when I was about to leave Mount Abu, I... It was on a Thursday morning. <clears throat> this was my first visit, and I'd been there six weeks. And in those days, there was many messengers, trance messengers. And the sister went into trance on the Thursday morning. And when she came back, she said, Baba gave a message for you. And Baba showed this scene. And I was walking along a path, and it was in a forest. And Baba showed this scene, you know, in trance, Baba shows a, a scene of, uh, you can see it like a movie in a way. <laughs> and I was walking, and as the further I walked, it became like a jungle. It was all dark and black. And the way the sister described, I was looking a little bit wary of this dark jungle. And then <clears throat> we came to the heart of the jungle, and there was a big open area. And in the middle of that open area, there was gold and jewels and diamonds and all this treasure. And Baba showed the scene that we were putting on the crowns and putting on the necklaces and putting on all the jewellery. And then Baba said something so wonderful. He said, child, wherever you go in this world, no matter how dark the jungle of this world is, you will find Baba's jewels there. And so, it's so he had showed this scene of us finding the jewels in the heart of the jungle. And that really, Baba just gave me so much courage to go out, because in those days there was very few centres outside of India, just a handful. 
And, you know, people who perhaps, you know, it was very, very new, all this sort of knowledge. And I was wondering, well, how do we offer it to people? How do we give it to them with a lot of love and respect? And this message just absolutely touched my heart. I then went back to London. And when I was back in London, I was getting more and more involved. I would go to the centre every single morning and listen to the Morley. And in 1976, Daddy Gozar went on a world tour. And when she was in London, she was there for a week or so, there was a brother there who had bad health and he couldn't travel to Madhuban to meet Aviak Babdada. And so one day in the class, he asked, Daddy, <clears throat> can Baba come and meet me in London? And Daddy Goza is so humble. She didn't say no. She said, I will ask Baba. So she went into trance and asked Baba. And Baba said, tell the children to sit in meditation and Baba will see the atmosphere. So Baba didn't say, yes, I will come, but he didn't say no, he wouldn't come. <laughs> so I can remember it was a Saturday night around July in 1976 in London. And we all sat in meditation for two hours. And then um, Daddy Gozar came in, she went into trance and Baba came. And Baba just gave drishti to this brother and gave drishti to all of us. He didn't speak, but what I learned was that if you're a faithful, true-hearted, obedient, loving child, really God does surrender to you. God really does become the obedient servant. It's not just words. Baba came and absolutely fulfilled the desire of that individual. It was really something absolutely extraordinary. And in that time in London also, I was quite new. And I remember that a few times I had the experience myself of going in trance. I didn't really even understand it at first because I was very new. But Twice I felt myself traveling an infinite distance. It was like I was pulled away from my body. I traveled an infinite distance <clears throat> and I came in front of the face of Bhaptada. You could say the face of the angel Brahma. And I can't describe how beautiful that face was. It's hard to describe in physical language. That face was so loving and glowing with purity and love and welcome. It was like the face was sh shimmering. The face was iridescent with light. It was just the most amazing face. And I, I really felt I met the angel Brahma. And I really felt that the extraordinary part of Brahma Baba, the one who had a family, the one who had a business, but the one who recognized God so deeply, the one who absolutely fell in love 100%. And on the basis of that, his renunciation and surrender took him to the highest place. And he let everything go because of his love for one, and he became the full angel. And I really felt that Baba showed me what an angel really looks like and was, you know, giving me the enthusiasm myself to make effort to really become like that angel. I had so many wonderful meetings with Bab Dada, but a few really are in my heart. <clears throat> and one of them was when I went to New York with Didi Man Mohini. Didi Man Mohini was the head of the Yajna until 1983 when she left her body. And this was in 1980. And on my way back, I stopped in Mount Abu. And I was the only double foreigner there at the time. But all the daddies, all the senior sisters had come for a meeting. 
And one day we were in, um, in the meditation hall in Pandav Bhavan and Daddy Prakashmani was reading the Moli. And those of us who remember Daddy Prakashmani reading the Moli, it was always just so incredibly entertaining. And Daddy was seeing all the elder sisters there and she would read a few words and then say, look, all of Baba's special children are here. Baba should come and meet you. Now, there wasn't a scheduled meeting for Bap Dada to come. And then she'd go back and read a few words and kept saying the same thing. And at the end of the morley, she said, Gulza, come, go to Baba. And Daddy Gulza, being her incredibly sweet and humble and obedient self as she is, she came and she went to Baba. And Baba came after morley, you know, like, 7.30 in the morning. And then Baba said, I haven't come to speak a moli. I've come to fulfill the love of the children. And each one came up and lay across Baba's lap. <clears throat> and Baba held them and stroked them and caressed them and showed them so much love. And you know what I realized when I saw that is the daddies are the embodiment, they're the Shiv Shaktis, the embodiment of humility but spiritual power. And I really saw why they became so powerful. They were loved so deeply that they let go everything of their past and they stepped into Baba's vision. They really became what Baba wanted them to become, the angels, the Shiv Shaktis of this world. And that was just so inspiring. And even once I was, you know, in Madhaban and we'd listened to a Morley. And the Morley had finished and all the beating of the Borg of Baba had been happening. And then <clears throat> everyone sat in front of Baba as they used to near Vairbhai, Daddy G, Daddy Prakashmi would sit on the floor before Baba takes leave. So everyone was sitting on the floor in front of Baba and Baba was giving Drishti, preparing to leave and go back. And he stopped. And he called Muni Ben over and said something to Muni Ben. And Muni Ben came back with a whole tin of toli, a huge katori of toli. And then Baba called me up and Baba gave me a whole tin of toli. <laughs> and then Baba said to me, share it with your friends. And I... You know, how touched was I? And I just feel that Baba knows how to really touch the heart. Baba knows what's in the heart. And Baba makes each one of us feel special. And in fact, the way to move forward in this life is to sit in Baba's drishti, feel how special I am. Each one of us is so special. And when we step into that place, we feel happy, enthusiastic and strong. And that was really such an incredibly special experience. And when I actually you know, practiced my or celebrated my 10th birthday, Baba um, invited all the double foreigners who were 10 years in Gyan, this was in 1985, to come on the stage. And so we sat in front of Baba, Baba gave us drishti, and usually Baba would give blessings, but this time he said, what is your specialty? What is your specialty? He asked us. None of us said anything. <laughs> but when he came to me, he said, your specialty is your love for Brahma Baba. And that made a lot of sense to me because I've always had such a feeling for Shiv Baba. I've always felt this deep love for the incorporeal and this feeling that the more I love Baba, Baba will make me pure. But a deep love for Brahma Baba, that his example of how to live in this world and not give sorrow and not take sorrow, and really how to be an angel in this physical world, I've always found so inspiring. And so that's really since then been a whole focus for me in my BK life to follow Brahma Baba. He's my example of how to live in this world. 
And in the early 1980s, I went to Calcutta once, and we had a huge celebration in Calcutta. And it was at the Queen Victoria Memorial. And while I was there, I went to Baba's shop. And Baba's shop was in the heart of Calcutta, where Brahma Baba used to work in the 1930s before he had visions and he started to become the instrument of Shiv Baba. That was just so touching because I went to Baba's shop and Baba's home was only about 50 metres away from the shop in the new market. And I went with Dada and Anka Shaw, who used to work in that shop with Baba, who was related to Baba. And Dada showed us the shop, showed us where Baba sat, where he sat, where Dada Vishwa Kishor also used to sit and told us stories. And while we were there, we went and saw and met other Sindhi jewelers. And some of them still had photos of those days, photos with Brahma Baba. And I saw, in a way, I had a little window into Baba's worldly life beforehand, how, how well off he was, how highly regarded he was, how they were really quite fashionable and popular in the community. And it really gave me an insight, actually, the massive change that Brahma Baba went through. Because only two years ago, I also visited Karachi. And I think that filled in something so deep inside of me, because I just spent a few days in Karachi, and the first place I went was Brahma Baba's home, where he lived. And he didn't live in Kunch Bhavan, where all the sisters would live with Mama. He lived about two kilometres away, a beautiful home, big home, stately home. And really, I went in that home, I spent a few hours there, and I was just so moved. It had such an incredible feeling. And then I went to Kunch Bhavan, where Baba would go each day and you know, speak the Muli. And I absolutely felt the atmosphere. I felt the incredible love that Shiv Baba bought and the love that Brahma Baba had for Shiv Baba and the love that the children have for Bap Dada and really how that love has sustained this organisation. That love is the yoga power that's really kept the Brahma Kumaris going so strongly. And I really feel that, you know, this relationship with Brahma Baba has really inspired me in my spiritual life. Because Brahma Baba had to face everything. And yet, because of his love for one, and because of his own practice, he faced it with so much humility, and he crossed every obstacle till he became the angel. And so, so many times when things are coming in front of me, situations, problems, I remember his example. And every time, I seem to know intuitively how he would respond. We all sometimes get shown some disrespect or, you know, some exclusion. That's a part of life. But whenever I think of Baba, I just know how we would always respond with wisdom, with spirituality, with humility, and with respect for everybody. And I think one of the ways that I want to follow the Father is in relationships with others. To me, when I see Brahma Baba, he just gave regard to everyone. He saw the soul. He saw the beauty in the soul. He understood each one's part, and he gave respect. And to me, that was why he became so great. He gave value to absolutely everyone. And I think he has given me a wonderful example of how to really move forward with that, you know, complete love and respect for all. And so coming up to the 18th of January, you know, once I was in uh, one of our retreat centres in Australia, and Daddy Prakashmani was with us. And she told us the story of the 18th of January because 
she was in Madhuban at that time. And I think as we know, you know, Baba gave the evening class, went to the door, took leave from the children, and went to his room. We know he just walked the 20, 30 metres to his room in Pandav Bhavan, and Dadiji followed him. And she described in great detail how she was in the room, and then Baba lay down, and then she, Baba was holding her hand, and she could feel Baba sort of leaving in a way. And the way she went, as she felt the life going out of the body, she sang, Baba, Baba, the way she said it was so moving. I don't think there was a, a dry eye in the whole hall. But, um, you know, tears of joy, the wonder of observing a human soul doing the greatest act in history of becoming an angel, which Brahma Baba did. And even Daddy that night had a little tear in her eye. And, you know, she told us the next day, I've told that story hundreds of times and I've never had tears. But the atmosphere was so beautiful because she was the one who witnessed you know, the efforts of the number one human soul, Brahma Baba, to become the full angel. It was so incredibly moving. And so really, I think in this life, we don't have to make our own path. Really, all we have to do is put the footsteps in, my steps in the footsteps of Brahma Baba. And when we follow the Father, we will reach the highest destination. So thank you so much. Om Shanti. Are you waiting? Wow. You know, I had a two or three false starts there, sorry. I don't know, today's been a few false starts. <laughs>